The world is in a constant state of change now more than ever. It's a world that requires resilience, flexibility, and innovation to overcome challenges and to pursue growth. That is why the University of the Philippines Los Baños is pursuing future-proofing initiatives to provide agile leadership and develop local and global communities amidst shocks and disruptions in an ever-changing world. Guided by compassion, an openness to working together, and a daring to seek out breakthroughs, UPLB constantly pushes for academic excellence, produces relevant research, establishes academic and industry partnerships, and cultivates creativity, critical thinking, and innovation. To keep up with the fast-changing world and to strive for inclusivity in development, UPLB seeks to level the playing field and expand avenues for acquiring new knowledge. Produces relevant research, it is reshaping the learning experience, enabling students and educators Produces to continue with the research. learning process, it is reshaping the learning different learning conditions. It is expanding its academic programs and supporting initiatives to create a conducive learning environment. To address the growing complexities of modern problems, UPLB continues to break barriers across disciplines to produce cutting-edge innovations and solutions that serve the needs of various communities. It is taking on challenges in food security and sustainability and coordinating research efforts to direct the university's resources toward critical research areas making sure that the university-generated knowledge can reach its intended stakeholders and be applied to real-life contexts. UPLB is dedicated to its commitment to contribute to public good and social welfare as it continues to work with the local government and the community to address their most pressing needs. Amidst its engagements, UPLB remains as one of the top regional and global universities and continues to be recognized in the country and across the world. As the national university, UPLB aims to be a steadfast partner in development as a producer of new approaches that minimize the cost and impacts of future shocks and by honing leaders committed to knowledge creation innovation and cutting-edge research, and public service. This is UPLB's roadmap to be an impactful institution in a constantly changing landscape. Responsive, innovative, future-proof. is in a constant state of change now more than ever. It's a world that requires resilience, flexibility, and innovation to overcome challenges and to pursue growth. That is why the University of the Philippines Los Baños is pursuing future-proofing initiatives to provide agile leadership and develop local and global communities amidst shocks and disruptions in an ever-changing world. Guided by compassion, an openness to working together, and a daring to seek out breakthroughs, UPLB constantly pushes for academic excellence, produces relevant research, establishes academic and industry partnerships, 
and cultivates creativity, critical thinking, and innovation. To keep up with the fast-changing world and to strive for inclusivity in development, UPLB seeks to level the playing field and expand avenues for acquiring new knowledge. It is reshaping the learning experience, enabling students and educators to continue with the learning process in vastly different learning conditions. It is expanding its academic programs and supporting initiatives to create a conducive learning environment. To address the growing complexities of modern problems, UPLB continues to break barriers across disciplines to produce cutting-edge innovations and solutions that serve the needs of various communities. It is taking on challenges in food security and sustainability and coordinating research efforts to direct the university's resources toward critical research areas, making sure that the university-generated knowledge can reach its intended stakeholders and be applied to real-life contexts. UPLB is dedicated to its commitment to contribute to public good and social welfare as it continues to work with the local government and the community to address their most pressing needs. Amidst its engagements, UPLB remains as one of the top regional and global universities and continues to be recognized in the country and across the world. As the national university, UPLB aims to be a steadfast partner in development as a producer of new approaches that minimize the cost and impacts of future shocks and by honing leaders committed to knowledge creation, innovation and cutting-edge research, and public service. This is UPLB's roadmap to be an impactful institution in a constantly changing landscape. Responsive, innovative, future-proof. Sino araw-araw ang nauhong o nahaharap sa pansparan ating Okay, so uh, good morning here huh? from Los Baños and Manila. I think it's 1 p.m. in Canberra, Australia and 7 p.m. in Edmonton, Canada. I, I think we're just hearing echo a bit. <laughs> I think today is special as we relish the gift of time, the gift of talent, and the gift of coming together. We bring three human ecology faculties. We are seeing here uh, our human ecology faculties in the University of the Philippines, Los Baños, Australian National University, and the University of Alberta. We also see our friends and colleagues here from development practice, the private sector, and from other higher education institutions. Aren't we excited? I think Zoom affords us to express our feelings and emojis. Let's have a heart emoji to express our excitement. <laughs> I think our students know how to use heart emojis. And, and of course, warm welcome to our colleagues and friends, the familiar faces who are here and those who are joining us, not just here on Zoom, but also on Facebook Live because we are now on Facebook Live at the UPLB College of Human Ecology official Facebook page. And of course, the different units, IHNF, DSERP, DSDS, and DHFDS um, Facebook page. I am Ron Dangkalan, Assistant Professor at the College of Human Ecology. And I am Mary Fedepito, Assistant Professor also from Czech. Welcome to the first Czech Conversations, Unpacking the Value of Human Ecology in an Increasingly Complex and Connected World. 
To formally begin our program, we'll play the video presentations of a prayer and the Philippine National Anthem. Yes, indeed, in proudly celebrating the human ecology story and our field, 
Let us hear our Chancellor of the University of the Philippines, Los Baños, who sent this video to welcome all of us in this webinar. To our esteemed guests, speakers, Dr. Sherian Chapman of the University of Alberta and Dr. Robert Dybol of the Australian National University. To our Assistant to the Vice Chancellor for Administration and Lead Organizer of this event, Dr. Jennifer Marie Amparo. And to the Dean of the UPLB College of Human Ecology, Dr. Ricardo Sandalo. To our faculty members, our reps, and administrative staff, and everyone joining us today, good morning. In the University of the Philippines, Los Baños, the College of Human Ecology advocates and uses interdisciplinary, holistic, and integrative approaches to understand human environment interactions. The college also envisions the development of human-centered, self-reliant, and ecologically stable communities by addressing basic human needs, resource utilization and management, environmental stability, and the delivery of social services, both at the family and community levels. UPLB is one of the few universities in Asia that offers the BS Human Ecology degree program. For more than 45 years, it has been the college's mission to advance this body of knowledge that covers human nutrition and food, human and family and child development, human settlements and environmental planning, and social technology. As such, College of Human Ecology is unique in UPLB as it works in instruction, research, extension, and public service are intimately implicated in the day-to-day -day life of families, communities, and local government units that have become our partners through the decades. The College of Human Ecology develops programs for research, training, and community service towards a desirable quality of life. As CHE's alumni have been instrumental in leading and serving the different sectors of our society through their balanced understanding of both the natural and the social sciences. In this regard, the College of Human Ecology's expertise will be vital in the work of future-proofing UPLB and in supporting the communities that the university serves, regardless of the challenges that we will come to face. Today's webinar, Che Conversations, Unpacking the Value of Human Ecology in an Increasingly Complex and Connected World, is a timely and important discussion on how the study and practice of human ecology can be used in sustainably addressing local and global socio-ecological challenges. This is particularly important as we continuously find sound and sustainable solutions not only in addressing climate change and food security but also in doing our share to achieve the 17 Sustainable Development Goals by 2030. Here at UPLB, we have rebranded our research 
an extension agenda and clearly aligned it to the SDGs. It is called the UPLB Agora, which stands for Accelerating Growth Through One Research and Extension in Action. And the interdisciplinary and holistic field of human ecology is one that is manifested in all of UPLB Agora's four pillars on food security and sovereignty, One Health, Resilience and Sustainability, and Future Communities and Institutions. As today's webinar presents an excellent opportunity to cultivate a broader appreciation of human ecology and to outline future directions for the human ecological praxis. I encourage everyone to listen attentively to our guest speakers and ask questions concerning today's topic. I wish everyone an insightful and uh, inspiring webinar. Thank you and uh, stay safe. Mabuhay tayong lahat. All right, and that is our Chancellor Jose V. Camacho Jr. Thank you very much for that um, welcome remarks. And now to give a special message, let us call on our Dean at the College of Human Ecology, who has been a strong supporter of revisiting our roots and mapping out the future of human ecology in UPLB. Let us all welcome Dean Ricardo M. Sandalo. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen in the Zoom room and in our FB page, wherever you are, a pleasant day, everyone. In behalf of the College of Human Ecology, let me welcome you to this very important and close to our heart webinar entitled Check Conversations, Unpacking the Value of Human Ecology in an Increasingly Complex and Connected World. On a personal note, let me express two words that would describe the emotions that I was experiencing while we were preparing for this webinar. The words are gratitude and optimism. Let me put forward my heartfelt thanks to the people who made this activity possible. Special mention to Assistant Vice Chancellor, Dr. Jenny Amparo and Assistant Professor Ron Dankalan. I would like also to thank our STEAM resource persons, Dr. Rob Daibol, President Emeritus of the Society for Human Ecology and Senior, Le Senior Lecturer at the Fenner School of Environment and Society at the Australian National University, and Dr. Sherry Ann Chapman from the Department of Human Ecology, Faculty of Agricultural, Life, and Environmental Sciences, University of Alberta, Canada. Thank you very much for being here today, our faculty, staff, students, our alumni, and everyone who are virtually present. Thank you even to those who will care to watch the replay of this webinar in our FB page and in our YouTube channel. Please accept my gratitude for your joining, joining the journey set forth by the UPLB College of Human Ecology, a journey that should seek first to understand the origins of our discipline as well as benchmarking our brand of human ecology with the rest of the world. These are exactly the reasons why we're holding this webinar today. On the side, and talking about our journey, I wish to inform everyone that after 48 years, when the then Institute of Human Ecology first offered its BS program in human ecology, we gladly announced today that the faculty and staff of your College of Human Ecology have resolved and committed ourselves that in a couple of years, we shall be able to offer a PhD in human ecology in whatever form, either as a regular program or by research, or perhaps straight from, from a bachelor of science to a doctoral program. 
Now on to my second word describing what I am feeling today, that is optimism. I wish to share to you my optimism that all of us will learn a lot from what our able research persons will share us with, with us today. I am very much hopeful that our faculty, after hearing on how human ecology is being taught elsewhere, will be able to help refine and or recalibrate our brand of human ecology as we move towards our hashtag Che 2050. I am very optimistic that from out of this webinar, we shall be able to harness with more gusto our discipline, our human ecological lens to address any or all pressing local and global social ecological challenges in our society today and in the future. I am expecting that our graduates will continue to uphold the dream of our first dean, Dr. Hill Sagigit Sr., that our college will enable the university to play or serve a functional role and exert a much more solid impact in national development. Finally, for those who might have heard for the first time what hu actually human ecology is, it is my wish that you will help us explain to others what we are and why we are as human ecologists fervently pursue this kind of discipline and perspective. Who knows next time when that we meet again, you will confide to us that you have in fact endorsed to your children, your nephews, nieces, your grandchildren, or maybe even your neighbors, the undergraduate and graduate programs in the college that is worth giving the first look in choosing their own career paths. Yes, we deserve as your first choice. Again, thank you very much everyone for coming here today. Let us continue to be thankful and hopeful. Let us listen and learn from our fellow human ecologists from the other parts of the globe. Magandang araw sa lahat at mabuhay. Thank you so much, Dean uh, Ricky, for championing for that very inspirational message full of gratitude and optimism. And we would like to thank you for championing human ecology and also for promoting this webinar. Um, can we give Doc uh, Ricky a heart emoji sa ating mga audience? Thank you again, Dr. Uh, Ricky Sandalo. So another message, uh, um, another special person who pushes us to engage in reflexive imagination and human ecology will give us a bit of background of what this webinar is about. So let us now hear from Associate Professor Maria Emelinda T. Mendoza. Take it away, Ma'am Emmy. Thank you, Ma'am Mafe. And good morning, Philippines. Good afternoon. Canberra and the rest of uh, Australia, and good evening to uh, Edmonton. Uh, let me share a couple of slides here to get the message across our rationale and uh, program overview. Okay, so the Czech Conversations is an ongoing initiative of the College of Human Ecology, University of the Philippines, Los Baños, envisioned to provide a platform for the discussion of human ecology as a perspective, as an approach, as a transdisciplinary area of academic concern, and as a relevant practice in the social and ecological spheres of humanity. As we find ourselves in an ever complex and connected world, we are more and more confronted with wicked problems from poverty to climate change, to issues of sustainability, to how to co-create more harmonious, caring and holistically healthy communities. We want to better understand the role that human ecology plays in addressing these issues. We want to draw inspiration and guidance from its rich history and the way in which human ecology is defined and practiced in different parts of the, of the world. We desire to seek ways to provide a space for conversations wherein we can unpack the value of human ecology as we continue to hold hands in our co-labor ship towards our shared goals 
those captured by the 17 SDGs and most especially those within the thematic areas of food security and sovereignty, resilience and sustainability, integrative human and ecosystem health, and how we envision future communities and institutions. So as such, the Czech Conversations webinar organized by Che UP Las Banos has the following objectives to discuss human ecology history and evolving definitions through time, to understand the value of human ecology in understanding the complexities of everyday life and social ecological dynamics. And lastly, to outline future directions for human ecological reflexive theorizing and action. As an overview, uh, this is a public webinar, and as such, it is open to attendance of the general public. We have faculty, colleagues, and students from UP Los Banos and the UP system at large, from the University of Alberta in Edmonton, and from the Australian National University in Canberra. We have also practitioners and lifelong learners of human ecology with us today. Our moderators, Professor Ron and uh, Professor Mafe, will also give us later a more complete view of our other colleagues, friends, and guests who have joined us. And our program will run for about two hours, so we expect to be done by around 12 noon Philippine time, that is 3 p.m. Canberra time, and late in the evening of the 23rd of February at 9 p.m. in Edmonton. We are blessed to have two distinguished speakers for this webinar each to be introduced before they are given their screen time. After which we shall open the floor to a Q&A session to be facilitated by our assistant to the Vice Chancellor for Administration of UPLB, Dr. Jenny Amparo. Then on to our closing program with the presentation of certificates and a closing message from Dr. Maria Teresa Talavera, our Associate Dean of the College of Human Ecology, UP Los Banos. So uh, without further ado, let me give you back to Prof. Mafe. Thanks, Prof. Emmy. So before we proceed with our program, just a reminder, by the way, you can ask questions via FB and Zoom. Just type your name, the institutional, your institutional affiliation, speaker to whom the question is addressed to, and your question. I repeat, you can type your, your question by typing in your name, institutional affiliation, speaker to whom the question is addressed to, and the question. And, right, and now I know that everyone is so excited to hear our speakers. We've seen the overview, so I think it's now time to introduce our first guest speaker, May I call on Dr. Amy Sherry Barion, the Director of Institute of Human, Human Nutrition and Food from the College of Human Ecology. You're on mute, Ma'am Amy. Yes. Thank you, Ma'am Mafe. So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. It's a privilege for me to introduce one of our esteemed uh, speakers for today, and that is Dr. Sherry Ann Chapman. Dr. Sherry Ann is the practicum coordinator in the Department of Human Ecology, Faculty of Agricultural uh, Life and Environmental Science, College of Natural and Applied Science, University of Alberta, Edmonton, Canada. She is also a professional human ecologist with a PhD in human ecology from the University of Alberta and a master's degree in museum studies from University of Toronto, uh, Dr. Sherry Ann has experience with academic and community-based research and community education practice, government policy-making discourse. Since 2018, as a practicum coordinator, uh, Dr. Sherry Ann continues to listen uh, for the meaning that people make in relationships with the context of daily life. With that, let us all welcome in the Zoom space, Dr. Sherry Ann Chapman. Hello, Dr. Sherry Ann. Hello, thank you very much for all of your warm welcomes and for that introduction, Dr. Amy Sherry Darion. Thank you. What an honor to join you all today. Shall I share my screen and proceed? Yes, yes. Dr. Sherry Ann, please. And 
And okay, thank you, Ron. <laughs> thank you. In the lands known internationally as Canada, in our society, we are trying to decolonize how we think and behave. And so I'd like to start by honoring place. As a non-Indigenous person, we are seeking to learn about the place where, in my case, where I live, learn, and work. And I'd like to offer gratitude for the diverse Indigenous and non-Indigenous cultures in the lands on which the University of the Philippines Los Banos exists as a gathering place, physically and virtually, and in Amiskwichi um, Waskagigan, which means Beaver Hills House in the Cree language, where the University of Alberta is located on Treaty 6 lands, the ancestral lands of the Pathas Chase peoples, and the homeland of Métis peoples. As I prepared for my talk, and as you heard from Dr. Amy just now, meaning making is the key thread of my career. For my undergraduate degree, I completed a BA in history, and then that led to a Master of Museum Studies. In the 1990s, I worked as a museum educator in two different major museums, and that work led to completing a PhD in human ecology. Then I facilitated workshops about community-based research and participatory action research. Now, my role with the Department of Human Ecology is very applied. I have the great privilege of welcoming undergraduate human ecology students into their human ecology degrees. I teach our 100 level course. And I also prepare them for their practicums in the field near the end of their undergraduate degrees. I help students to make meaning about human ecology as a field of study and as a profession. Our students learn about ecological consciousness and strive not only to develop skill with systems thinking, but also to be reflective practitioners. In Canada, with our house history of household economics, home economics, and human ecology, I will use the letters H, E as a shorthand to refer to the various variations of names of academic units, the field of study, and the profession. And as another clarifying point, in Canada, as you might know, we have various regions which are either called provinces or territories. And today I will speak about the province and the government of Alberta as a context for the University of Alberta. The main campus of the U of A is located in Amasquichi Waskagigan, or what is now also known as the city of Edmonton. To prepare for today's panel discussion, I was curious about how the College of Human Ecology at the University of the Philippines Los Banos approaches this topic. And I noticed this definition uh, that I'd like to quote from the article by Dr. Jennifer Amparo and colleagues in 2019. Although human ecology is commonly defined as the study of the interaction of humans and their environment, the lens and focus vary across academic fields. I agree. For interest, here's the definition that I offer students in our 100 level course. I explain that it is a working or a living definition, which assumes that it can be changed as I proceed on my life learning, long learning journey. Human ecology is the study and co-creation of compassionate, interdependent and sustainable relationships with individuals, families and communities in support of well-being. These relationships exist between and among various contexts including near environments, such as home, clothing, families, and food, all relative to whole systems like society and earth. And part of my understanding is informed by the work 
by Buboltz and Sontag in 1988. Even as definitions of human ecology vary, I also agree with Nichols and Collier and how they describe that three elements have remained constant in the profession and the field of study in terms of North American context, at least. An interdisciplinary knowledge base, a mission intended to elucidate, enlighten, and empower, and the multidisciplinary practices of the profession, including teaching, research, and service to others. In the Department of Human Ecology at the U of A, faculty members are very diverse. We have backgrounds in human ecology, anthropology, psychology, sociology, nursing, history, engineering, museum studies, and probably more. However, what holds us together is our shared sense of purpose or mission. And we talk about it as enhancing everyday life. And to do that, we do use systems thinking. Those hold us together. This background for the evolution of the HE academic unit and then evolution of our name and identity. I'll offer this overview of that evolution at the University of Alberta. It was established in 1908 in a tradition similar to a land grant university with extension services. In 1918, the first unit was established as the Department of Household Economics in the Faculty of Arts and Science. 1928, the School of Household Economics. We grew a bit and we became a school. <laughs> By 1965, the school was organized in three divisions, foods and nutrition, clothing and textiles, and general home economics. Within a few years though, that general home economics division became known as family studies. In 1966, we also became autonomous, so that it was still the School of Household Economics, but we were no longer within the Faculty of Science. We were a standalone unit. Ten years later, we became the Faculty of Home Economics. And at the time, the change, and I'm quoting the Dean at about 1976, Dean Badir, described that the change from household to home was a way to make the name more descriptive of the faculty's areas of concern. Becoming a faculty also meant that we were becoming a larger unit on the U of A campus. And that I imagine is linked to the baby boom population after the second world war in Canada. All of those young children had become young adults and were seeking education. And we saw growth in home economics. About 12 years later, the Dean Eloise Murray struck a task force to consider the possibility of a name change to the Faculty of Home Economics. And by 1993, there was great reorganization of society in the province of Alberta. There were changes to funding from the government of Alberta that meant reorganizing of the university structure. And so that then meant that the Faculty of Home Economics was merged into a new Faculty of Agriculture, Forestry and Home Economics. And our divisions were teased apart. So the Department of Food and Nutritional Science emerged. Food and Nutrition was removed into one unit within this new faculty and clothing and textiles and family studies were put together in this new Department of Human Ecology. As time went on, the name of the faculty changed in 2007. And just last year, we then had an additional layer of structure added to the university. And so now we are in the College of Natural and Applied Sciences. At a glance, I think that the, these changes really do reflect what is happening in society. At a first glance, I think it's helpful to know that in 1900, the Canadian Household Economics Association was started. In 1911, in the government of Alberta used domestic economy as a term. 
And so it's not surprising, perhaps, that this idea of household economics was adopted as the first name at the U of A. Moving into the 1960s, I think it's also helpful to understand or to consider the environmental revolution, as Lester Brown has called it, really started to emerge. And so in the 1960s to the present, there is this sense of an environmental context. And we see that in the academic work at the U of A, this concept of ecology. Certainly in the North American standard story of what is home economics and human ecology, there is this concept of ecology way back in the 1890s with Ellen Swallow Richards, one of the organizing figures for us in our story. She proposed home ecology as a name for this new profession, but that name wasn't picked up. In 2011, more recent years, a Canadian colleague, Dr. Susan McGregor, has described various scholars' efforts to track this ecological thread of our history. And they describe a gap of 60 years from the early 1900s to the 1960s. And again, I, I link that with what I understand as the beginning of the environmental revolution in the 1960s. So by the time that the creation of the Faculty of Home Economics at the U of A occurred in 1976, that is a few years into the environmental revolution. And at about that time, as a new faculty was um, opened up, there was also a decision to offer a new course that was called Perspectives in Home Economics. And it was intended to help students understand how they were all connected within this faculty, even as they were specializing in these three different divisions. And in preparing to launch that course, the U of A invited Dr. Eleanor Baines from the University of British Columbia to work with the U of A home economics faculty. At the time, she was an associate professor in the School of Family and Nutritional Sciences at the University of British Columbia. And they invited Dr. Baines to help with the conceptual nature of this course. And at the time, so this is 1976, she encouraged U of A colleagues to consider, and this is a quotation, to consider how higher education home economics curricula could engage students in environmental terms. So she was making explicit this environmental revolution as context. And later, perhaps as you know too, in 1994, she published her paper titled Ecology as a Unifying Theme for Home Economics and Human Ecology. And in the abstract for that article, she wrote, as active participants in daily life, families form interconnected, intricate and complex webs in relation to other living systems. This foundation can facilitate a better understanding of ecology as a unifying theme essential to home economics and human ecology as a whole. So, as early as the mid-1970s, the HE academic unit was beginning to think in environmental terms. Then in 1993, when the reorganization occurred from Faculty of Home Economics to Department of Human Ecology, Dr. Betty Crown was the dean of the faculty at that time. In, 19, in, sorry, in 2017, I asked Dr. Crown about that change in 1993. She remembered a lot of soul searching that happened at the U of A when choosing a new name. The name chosen was human ecology. And yet with these contexts, societal and academic environmental revolution, the context I've highlighted, I think in hindsight, this name change seems like a natural progression. Even Dr. Crown reflected in this way, as I've put the quotation on the screen, a human ecological framework has always informed my research. 
if we're talking about clothing and especially protective clothing, humans and their environments, interaction with their environments could be fire, you know, danger. I started working in protective clothing before I knew anything about a human ecological framework. But when I read about human ecological frameworks, it was just, oh, this is what I do. It informs my research so perfectly. In sum, at the U of A, we decided to adopt the name of this lens as our name for the field of study and profession. And on the left of the screen, I just show that progression through time. On the right of the screen, I show this ecological thread as it has been described in the American profession. And yet also in the center of the screen, I refer to a number of the different names that also are being used in Canada and in the United States. Perhaps they're familiar to you too. And some people are concerned that with the specialized names, we lose track of the overall big sense of what is this field of study and profession. And so I come to that concept of reflexive imagination. How is HE positioned in the present as we look to the future? Shaw and Crowther offered this definition. Reflexive imagination is the capacity to see oneself, one's identity and traditions as simultaneously part of both the problem and the possibility of democratic life. Home economics, human ecology was organized in North America as a field of study and a profession in the late 1890s, early 1900s in response to needs in North American society and how it was changing. The field was shaped by ideas and norms of that colonized society. It was informed by people who had firsthand experience with the needs of families and the private spheres of homes. Those people were typically women and they led the organization of this field. This was a period in time that was motivated by progress through mechanization and industrialization. However, again, with the benefit of hindsight, HEs are beginning to recognize that even though the HE profession was trying to help individuals, families, and communities, the colonial dimension of those efforts as part of a massive system of colonization contributed to creating intergenerational trauma for the indigenous peoples who live as the first peoples in this land, in this place. In 2015, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada made its final report regarding the damage and trauma caused by the system of residential schools that ran for 150 years across Canada. Collectively, society has begun to grapple with the destructive impacts of Eurocentric, patriarchal, racist, industrial, capitalist ideology, that led to the formation of residential schools that were designed to assimilate Indigenous children by taking them away from their families, languages, and cultures. The HE profession has begun to understand its complicity with the residential schools. That learning environment imposed norms and ways of, and I'm quoting here, European domesticity with the help of the popularization of the manual training movement in the early 20th century. I'm quoting a colleague at, uh, in British Columbia who has studied this area, Ayala Johnson. Now I'd like to quote from another colleague, Hansen, in 2009, who described the nature of the residential schools. On the screen is a photo of the Edmonton Indian Residential School, as it was called in 1930. So close to the area in which the U of A is located. The residential schools were sorely underfunded. Teachings focused primarily on practical skills. Girls were primed for domestic service and taught to do laundry, sew, cook, and clean 
Boys were taught carpentry, tinsmithing, and farming. Many students attended class part-time and worked for the school the rest of the time. Girls did the housekeeping, boys general maintenance and agriculture. This work, which was involuntary and unpaid, was presented as practical training for the students, but many of the residential schools could not run without it. That's the end of the quotation from Hansen. Another way to glimpse at this is a quotation from 1997, Diane Renke, who completed her master's degree at the U of A in family life education. And in her thesis, she states, experts can't claim that the high crime rates, pervasiveness of family violence, incidents of alcoholism and suicide, high unemployment rates, lack of education and poverty in Northern communities are considered to be a result of the residential school experience. That's the end of the quotation. I imagine that teachers who worked in residential schools studied HE at universities across Canada. HEs contributed to intergenerational trauma for Indigenous families for generations through much of the 20th century. As Canadian society grapples with this shared responsibility for destruction of Indigenous cultures, languages, and ways of knowing and being, HEs are beginning to see how we are, again to quote, simultaneously part of both the problem and the possibility of democratic life. And so what do we do? HEs share responsibility for contributing to a reconciling society hearing the truths of what Indigenous families experienced and offering what we can to help the healing processes in multiple ways, in professional practice, as informed by collaborative research and policy making with Indigenous families, communities, by enhancing HE curricula so that it is informed by the place in which it is taught, informed by Indigenous ways of knowing and being by asking, how are we helping to unlearn racist and colonialist norms that shape Western Canadian society? And I'm quoting Dr. Dwayne Donald, an indigenous colleague at the U of A when I say unlearn. And very importantly, by asking, how can HEs learn from indigenous individuals, families and communities about indigenous ways of knowing and being? because through cultural resilience and the incredible will to survive, diverse indigenous ways of knowing and being are being revived. As a non-indigenous person, I am grateful for the concept of two-eyed seeing, a way of knowing described by indigenous Mi'kmaq elder Albert Marshall. He describes that the concept honors the wisdom of the first peoples of a place, and is also open to additional ways. For example, Western seeing. This two-eyed seeing concept also brings to mind an eco-centered philosophical lens as described by Dr. Eleanor Baines. With this lens, HEs strive to practice a power with approach, which is based on part on an assumption that clients know their lives the best and HEs can try to learn from clients about what they need. Human ecologists as individuals need to practice humility. The HE field as a collective, I think needs to practice cultural humility. Turbalon and Murray Garcia describe this concept of cultural humility and Chavez has produced a short film that helps to understand it. Cultural humility, as it says on the screen, requires lifelong learning and commitment to self-reflection with reflex with flexibility, recognizing and challenging power imbalances and systems for respectful partnerships, and seeking institutional accountability and responsibility to model these principles. HEs as part of systems such as post-secondary institutions 
can learn to integrate cultural humility into research, program planning and evaluation and policy making. So thinking about purpose of HE in a connected world, as humanity in relationship with Earth faces wicked problems, HEs need to continue with our shared mission to the best of our abilities and with cultural humility. At the U of A in 2017, staff collectively identified this purpose statement for the Department of Human Ecology, advancing scholarship to enhance everyday life. And I'll add, as we focus particularly on how individuals, families, and communities strive for well being in relationship with their family members, homes, clothing, and food, all within the larger context of society and the planet. As HEs, we need to keep top of mind and in our being one of the characteristics of our field and profession to guide our work, ecological consciousness. Ecological consciousness refers to a state of being aware of how one is related in interdependent ways to other living organisms in various environments or contexts. I think that this awareness means being not only culturally humble, but also ecologically humble. And I came across that term from an article by Penniman. Where has HE come from? How are we part of efforts to help people? What mistakes has the profession made? How can we choose to move into the future with cultural and ecological humility? What can the HE profession and field of study learn from Indigenous people's resilience? I've read also about the concept of ecological resilience and that it requires, and I'm quoting Williams here, it requires a decentering of the primacy of human need in response to upheaval, such as that experienced in existential crises that we are becoming familiar with, whether it's COVID-19 or climate catastrophe. How can the concept of ecological resilience help us to contextualize a complex diversity of needs, not only human, but also Earth's needs. As you see on the screen, Williams describes ecological resilience as relying on links between human cultural diversity and biodiversity in ways that acknowledge the need for a multiplicity of ways of knowing, recentering those cultural and spiritual values, often indigenous worldviews that emphasize developing a caring and intimate dialogue with place. I am inspired by Dr. Eleanor Vane's encouragement to use an ecological lens. She invites us to think of everyday life in terms of being aware of the interdependence of people in webs of life, as she says, or systems. The 21st century, she says, is full of rich possibilities. Our new stories should be about choosing ways of living together that re-enchant, interrelate, and honor the webs of life. This means we must use our imaginations, see ourselves as co-creators, and live in ways that consistently nurture the underlying metaphor, the world is our home. And that's the end of the quotation from Dr. Baines in 2004. This planet is our home. We are a part of nature. Indigenous peoples and ways of knowing invite non-Indigenous people to understand that. To respond to wicked problems, we will need all the ways of knowing and being that are part of the amazing diversity of all types of life and living systems. Each HEs need to foster our reflexive imaginations cultural humility and ecological consciousness to join the collective effort to be ecologically resilient in everyday life, because that is ultimately at the heart of life. Dr. Baines offered this encouragement, and I'll conclude with this. She said, yet the need for the study and practice of every day is more important than ever. The evidence is overwhelming that family life is not only an important area of study by scholars, it is one that is needed at all levels of the educational system. Translating the scholarly into the curriculums for every level of education is not only important for the common good, 
but for the health and well being of a nation. And I'll add the well being of the planet. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chapman, uh, for that very um, inspiring and touching sharing with regards to the journey of human ecology in the University of Alberta. Um, we will hear more from uh, uh, Dr. Sharif for our uh, open forum, but right now I think I uh, would, would like to invite everyone to give uh, Dr. Chapman our heartwarming emoji from, the, <laughs> from where we are right now. Yeah. And uh, thank you again, Dr. Ch uh, Sherry. Um, for our audience, I just wanted to share that um, we were really star starstruck by her MP lecture in YouTube, uh, which was bro broadcasted in 2018. We watched her MP lecture together with Prof. Ron several times. And when Prof. Ron messaged her for this lecture, she immediately responded and the rest is history. And we are really thankful for Dr. Sherry for being with us this morning. And uh, as I mentioned, she will join us uh, later uh, for the question and answer. So you could reserve your questions for Dr. Sherry. But right now, I'll, now, I'll pass the Zoom to uh, my co-host, um, Assistant Professor Ron J. Dankalan. Take it away, Sir Ron. Thank you so much, uh, Prof. Mafe. My head is actually spinning. Is that what the other colleagues <laughs> in the college are also feeling? So I think the chat group of uh, the college and also the departments, I think, are um, being hot right now because of all the exchanges and many quotable quotes uh, from the presentation. Um, Thank you, Dr. Sherry, and just wow. Now, just a reminder, our colleagues, by the way, are collecting your questions on Facebook Live. I think we are now 263 on Zoom, and I think we are around 50. If I'm not mistaken, I'll just check. We are around, um, we are a lot also. Now we are around 58 um, on Facebook Live. So I think more or less we are around more than 300 here um, who are watching. Uh, what a celebration of human ecology. Um, now let us keep the ball rolling, shouldn't we? That's just the first part. I think Dr. R.G. Albor, the chair of the department of uh, DHFDS, is so ready to introduce our speaker all the way from Canberra, Australia. Dr. R.G., please do the honor of introducing our speaker. Okay, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, I am pleased to introduce to you our second speaker this morning. Our distinguished speaker convenes the Human Ecology Program at the Fenner School of Environment and Society at the Australian National University. He is also a visiting professor at our very own College of Human Ecology, University of the Philippines, Los Baños. His current research centers on the application of dynamic systems thinking to problems in human ecology and sustainability science more generally. He has been involved in a range of projects that focus on global food systems. He is the Food and Nutrition Security Working Group Leader for the Sustainable Cities and Landscape Hub of the Association of Pacific Rim Universities. He is also involved with a range of activities around education for sustainability and is particularly interested in the potential contribution of online modules to enhance international teaching and learning collaborations, particularly in partnerships with regional developing nations. He is the President Emeritus of the International Society for Human Ecology, and is also the Chair of the Human Ecology Section for the Ecological Society of America. He is the editor of the, of the journal Human Ecology Review and the co-chair of the ANU Humanities and Social Sciences Delegated Ethics Review Committee. He has also been the academic advisor to the Australasian campuses towards sustainability and has been awarded an Australian Learning Teaching Council citation for outstanding contribution to student learning. With Barry uh, Newell, he is author of Understanding Human Ecology, published by Routledge in 2015. Dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Robert Dybald. Thank you very much. I'll start by sharing my screen. We see it, Dr. Rob. Good to go. You can? 
Yes, you thank it? you, Dr. Rob. Yes, we okay, see beautiful. It. Um, okay, so thank you, uh, thank you very much uh, for inviting me to uh, to speak to you. Uh, it's lovely to catch up with you all again, Ricky, Jenny, um, and all the other uh, the rest of you over uh, there in the Philippines. And I sincerely hope that I can uh, come over and see you again before very much longer. It's been uh, an awful long time that we've all been uh, stuck uh, in lockdown. Okay, so, oh, hang on. I, I think we can share, Dr. Rob. Uh, just do that again. I think that just happened. Uh, sorry, we're back. We're back, yes. yes? Thank you, sir. <clears throat> so um, I am uh, uh, very pleased to have been invited to speak on the topic, uh, human ecology's role in addressing wicked problems. And uh, as you've just heard, I'm Dr. Robert uh, Dival from the Human Ecology Program at the Australian National University. And uh, I hopefully someone will give me a, a heads up if I start to run out of time. I'd like to commence with an acknowledgement of country and acknowledge that uh, and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands the Australian National University operates, primarily the Ngunnawal and Narago people. And I'd like to pay mine and behalf of us all in this room our respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. And uh, Dr. Chapman said an awful lot of, about the importance of recognizing, embracing and working with and learning from indigenous cultures and worldviews and First Nations peoples uh, everywhere. Uh, a brief overview of where I'm hoping to go in today's, uh, this, this fairly short talk, half an hour. Uh, I'd like to touch just briefly on how human ecology is understood and presented at the Australian National University, because as we heard from the previous speaker, uh, we, I think we generally know human ecology is not a, uh, a discipline with just a single way of, of operating and thinking. So I'd like to touch on how we at the ANU, Australian National University present. I've then been asked to talk a little bit more about wicked problems, and what are wicked problems? And what particular challenges do wicked problems place upon us when we're trying to work and resolve them? So why do we need to understand wicked problems? And then uh, how and why uh, do I think, and I suspect we share the view, that human ecology is particularly well placed uh, to be a primary vehicle for engaging with wicked problems. So why is human ecology, if you like, the right tool for the job? And then introduce some elements of the systems thinking approach that we use at the ANU to inform a framework that we can uh, usefully use and teach to our students and apply in our research uh, as a framework uh, for tackling wicked problems. And to wrap off, as, uh, as Ron has invited me, uh, what are some of the future directions that I see uh, for human ecology uh, in an increasingly complex and interconnected world? So, uh, not, uh, well, uh, strongly resonating with the uh, definition uh, Dr. Chapman uh, gave us, uh, human ecology at the ANU, uh, can be thought of as being about the interrelationships between humans, their cultures, and their ecosystems. And the key word in that mix is interrelationships. So we're uh, interested in looking at how these blocks of uh, areas of understanding interact and cause change in one another uh, over time. So changing uh, aspects of the culture, changing aspects of the ecosystem, and those changes in that 
ecosystem being reflected back upon the culture that, that caused that change for good or for ill. So uh, because this is the nature of the thing that we're interested in, we seem to have set ourselves a challenge to understand two things, which in a nutshell could be summarized as asking questions about why do we do what we do? Uh, and then a second related question is, what does what we do do? In other words, what is the consequences of the things that we do? What does it cause? How does it change the world? And then what are the consequences of that for us? And at the ANU, we're seeking to develop the competencies that students need to understand these processes, but also to put that into practice. And so, unlike maybe some other disciplines or some other approaches to teaching and learning in the university context, we're specifically trying to develop uh, our students and ourselves as change agents. We want to intervene in the world to change the way those relationships are working. And I've included just a little bit of ANU history in a single photograph. Uh, the photo in this screen is the human ecology program at uh, its formal foundation in 1972. And uh, the people in that photo stand around the foundation, founder of human ecology at the ANU, Stephen Boyden, who's the gentleman with the beard in the middle of the table. And those are the members of the Hong Kong project. The Hong Kong project was a, a study done uh, in the 1970s to look at, uh, at the city of Hong Kong uh, and was subtitled The Ecology of a City and Its People. Okay, so let's, uh, uh, that's just a little bit of where human ecology gain use is coming from. Uh, and so let's move on. So I put this up. Now, I don't know how many people in the room recognize the blue gentleman with the green hair. Uh, I can't see your reactions as to, uh, if you're in the audience, I'd ask you to put your hands up. He's getting a little bit old now, but um, uh, you might recognize him. Some of you might recognize him as, as Captain Planet. Captain Planet was a, a cartoon hero that my children used to like to watch. Uh, some years back now. But there was an interesting uh, phenomenon in, in the way uh, environmental problems were portrayed uh, in, in Captain Planet uh, and the way uh, that they were solved. And this, I think, is a narrative that, that still holds with how many people think about environmental problems. When things go wrong in the environment, pollution happens or some damage is done. It often seems to be characterized in many people's minds as because some bad person is doing something wrong. Uh, that bad person motivated by whatever, you know, maleficent motivations they have to get up in the morning and, and somehow go out to harm, damage the planet. And the solution to, to this problem is that we need a hero to fly in and teach them a lesson and fix the problem. And that was Captain Planet's role. He would turn up and uh, take pollution down to zero, I think was his slogan. And as a result of this, the problem would be solved. Everyone would be happy, except, of course, the bad person who had been biffed on the nose and stopped from doing whatever they were doing. And I suggest uh, it would be a wonderful thing if, uh, if the nature of sustainability problems, problems of justice and injustice in the world were so easily caused and so easily solved. Uh, but I suggest to you that they are not like that at all. And so they are characteristically wicked problems. And again, Dr. Chapman uh, used that language as well. So wicked problems. The, the reality of the problems that we're challenged to try and deal with are not as simple as dear old Captain Planet would have us think. And so uh, you may know the origins of the term wicked problems goes back some 
time to the 1970s. It originally comes from a slightly different context from Rittle and, uh, and Weber. Um, but they're characterized by a, a number of distinctive features that make them, that give them their wicked nature. They're characterized by unclear definitions, uh, different stakeholders engaging in wicked problems uh, or trying to collaborate on solving them, uh, oftentimes have very different ideas of what the actual nature of the problem is. Um, uh, someone coming from an economics background may presuppose that the problem to, uh, to be solved is one of an economic nature. Uh, someone from a conservation background may not agree with that uh, concept at all and hold that the, the problem trying to be solved is, a, is of a very different category of thing. Wicked problems and the stakeholders that are affected by them and trying to manage them come to that space with a whole pile of value-laden ideas about what would constitute success. Uh, one group's idea of, of, of a wicked problem being solved might be another group's idea of the, the very opposite, being uh, that problem being made uh, worse. So one group's winning might come at a, another group's losing. Classic example of this might be to exclude uh, farmers from a particular landscape in the name of conservation. So excluding farmers and their cattle from a particular landscape to allow that to become a national park would be for the farmers a, a, a loss. These problems typically don't have right or wrong outcomes. They're sometimes better or worse, and very frequently just deemed that the situation is now simply good enough to, to not bother with trying to solve any further and just to, to leave it as it is. When we intervene in wicked problems, we often create new problems, typically after a, de a delay. We intervene in wicked problems with, with good intent, uh, but oftentimes uh, un unforeseen and unintended consequences arrive after a time lag. So irrigating agriculture, irrigating landscapes to produce greater food yields, that's done on purpose. The rising water table and accompanying salinity uh, was not intended. Uh, occurs after a delay and makes the problem worse. And uh, people engaging in the problems are often coming from a, a, a range of back, a range of institutions and backgrounds with cross sector drivers of change. So, uh, an organisation charged with uh, improving traffic flow may build more freeways. An organisation charged with uh, uh, individual health and well-being might suffer the consequences of the increased pollution in the environment from people using their cars more. And throughout, these problems are riven with issues of justice and fairness, and who is experiencing the benefits of the way the environment is being interacted with, and who is experiencing the burdens. So left unresolved, why we need to understand them better and, and interact with them better, Left unresolved, they are what is uh, what the Open University uh, would would term uh, simply a mess. We'd, we just have a mess. We have a, 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 a we need to we need to do something to make sense of it more than this. And that link at the bottom there uh, will take you to some uh, free online systems thinking courses that you can uh, take yourself through at the Open University. Originally created by my colleague Ray Ison. But policy interventions that uh, only address parts of a problem in isolation of the whole will typically fail. Often those interventions will simply make matters worse and not better, uh, and inevitably uh, will or has the tendency to lead to community conflict and mistrust. And I think we need to remind ourselves to the extent that you would assign, regard yourself as a conservationist or someone interested in sustainability outcomes, intervening in a community issue uh, in, the, in the name of sustainability does not give you a right to ride roughshod over community uh, sensibilities. So imposing, for example, um, uh, say wind turbines into the community in the interest of creating a green energy infrastructure does not give you the right to not negotiate uh, where those community members are 
coming from and how they feel or desire that those wind turbines to be installed on their landscapes. We need to have a framework that's going to bring together those people who are engaged with the problems and often more than, more than anyone, the communities who will own the problem when we've gone away um, and enable uh, a, 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 a collective understanding and a collective willingness to own and accept the, the problem and its solutions and not just uh, uh, parachute those solutions in from outside uh, and then uh, sort of ride off into the sunset, uh, having, uh, having uh, told the community what it is that they need to do. So at the ANU, uh, we adopt uh, a systems-based framework to provide uh, this way of organizing and thinking about uh, what are the important elements of these wicked problems and how we might better understand them uh, with a view to better uh, intervening, finding leverage points uh, to, to intervene and to uh, improve uh, how the system is behaving. And this, the systems-based framework we have brings your attention to the four major categories of... So, Someone needs to mute their microphone as they cough. Four major categories of uh, classes of things that will be interacting in a human ecological system of interest. There will be some a class of things that reflect how humans' health and well-being is being affected, for better or worse, uh, and not necessarily equally. How the environment is being changed. Uh, and what are the relevant formal and, inf and informal institutions that are organizing collective behavior to, to create those actions, to change those categories of things? And most importantly, to bring attention to those worldviews, those dominant beliefs and values that are informing how those institutions are trying to, uh, to change the environment to what ends uh, because oftentimes the role of cultural paradigms of dominant beliefs of marginalized beliefs and values uh, are not in, not included in our inquiries uh, and left left uninterrogated in the process of actually creating uh, on the ground projects uh, this framework with these very abstracted uh, uh, categories of variables would need to then be populated through through interaction with the stakeholders through interaction with the uh, with the uh, members of the uh, of the uh, of the transdisciplinary group uh, that is trying to solve the problem so you'd actually have to sit down and have a conversation with people about what sorts of things uh, are uh, relevant within those categories, these very high level categories that I have in this diagram. And ask these questions about how is the system changing over time? What is the, the influence, for better or worse, often for worse, of dimensions of social power? Is the kind of change that's being um, created, is it, just and is it just and is it sustainable? And asking this overarching and important question is the system, what is the system being, what is the system for, and is it doing that job well? We could throw through these approaches, throw the focus of our interest onto trying to understand the structure of the systems within which certain behaviors are being conducted. And in this diagram, I have simply uh, thrown up an archetype system structure where intervention is, uh, is being made to fix what's seen as the, uh, as the problem uh, and that uh, intervening to fix the problem makes the problem better and that's good, that's why we do it. However, the same intervention is exacerbating a deeper underlying problem that's actually making the problem worse. And I've simply given uh, a little example here of uh, as an example that probably doesn't make sense in the University of the Philippines context, which is uh, the, the vice chancellor of the Australian National University 
building car parks uh, to make the problem of students who like to drive their cars in Australia or to university to make that problem go away. So the number of cars parked being built reduces the amount of complaints the vice chancellor receives. But that same action of building car parks increases the attractiveness of driving and so actually increases the number of cars being driven onto campus and that actually makes the problem of availability of car parks worse. So embarking on a car park strategy to make the problem of um, insufficient car parks go away actually serves in the longer term to make that problem worse. And you can see that the same, the same structure exists in the problem I have on the other side involving diversion of grey water from showers and to, as, a, as a way of reducing total, gray, or total water usage on campus to make that problem go away. Uh, the fact that students know that the water is being diverted actually reduces their concern over their shower lengths and makes their showers longer. And so the total volume of water being used goes up. So they're very different contexts that they're there. They're, they're just trivial examples, but they both show, share that same structure of a fix that's intended to make a problem go away, but actually serves to exacerbate it when you look at it in its broader context. And we need to remind ourselves that these problems will behave in this way until we change the structure, but it's only when we change the structure that we change the behaviour. And so again, I can't have a conversation with you because, um, because we're in webinar land, but we could break at this point and discuss how, in terms of system structure, how different is it really to change from growing bananas as, an, as, a, as a commodity uh, to growing jackfruit as a commodity. Has that in some sense profoundly changed how uh, that, uh, that smallholder farmer uh, sits in the context of the food production system? And we could then go on to discuss what might be some more deeper leverage points and more significant changes that could be made to the system as a whole that would actually do something more profound to change the way that that smallholder farmer sat within that overall food production system. And we could start to talk about things like whether farmers cooperatives might help better, whether things like value adding within the barangay might, might be a, a different way of going, different ways of sharing the profits and uh, the risks of growing uh, fruits for commodity production. And we could ask which of those were actually more profoundly changing the structure of the system so that the position the farmer found themselves in uh, was more fundamentally lifted and improved than just changing uh, the actual uh, type of fruit being grown. This system uh, approach uh, is useful uh, because uh, it does allow application across scales. Uh, we can think about uh, that household and community level scale uh, that we were listening to when Dr. Chapman was, uh, was speaking. And we can think about uh, these interactions at, that, uh, at, the, at the level of family dynamics, at the level of community dynamics. Uh, and we can think about them at larger scales, such as the scale of the city, the scale of the city in relationship to its region, and of course, the way that nations uh, move goods hither and yon around the planet, uh, moving food grown in Australia to be consumed in Tokyo and, and those much larger scales. And we can use this to ask questions such as what goods can and should be produced at which scale, measuring things like movement of materials or energy costs. We can ask that for each scale, how can harms be, the harm being caused, how can those harms be minimized and how can we structure the system so that those benefits can be maximized? And we can reach for some fundamental principles of sustainability in terms of uh, closed loop economies, circular economies, recycling materials within a CO2 neutral circular economy, which obviously gets progressively harder the more uh, globalized the system is. And for all axes in the system at all scales, we can ask. Uh, try to reach the challenge of how can we ensure that the system is delivering justice and sustainability for everyone in, involved in it. So I've 
just closing up now on the question of future directions, uh, the subtitle of uh, where am I going and why, and why am I in this handcart? I think um, even prior to COVID-19, I think uh, there's been increasing recognition, uh, increasing recognition that the paradigm that brought us to the point in, uh, to, to this uh, earth uh, system state that we call the Anthropocene, where human human cultures have emerged as a force in nature, uh, the paradigms that brought us here cannot possibly lead us into just and sustainable futures. Um, and we must acknowledge the untold damage that the paradigm that took us into the Anthropocene has caused to environments and societies through processes of colonization and globalization of, of, uh, of landscapes and peoples uh, to get us to uh, the conditions of the Anthropocene. And I think uh, that we've seen in COVID-19 an, an exacerbation and a highlighting of the frailties that that global system uh, had and pre-existed, uh, but very much, I think, have brought them to, uh, to, a, to a fore. And just a trivial example is the vulnerabilities, for example, of just-in-time uh, supply, global supply mechanisms that um, uh, have, uh, have, have failed in many places across the globe. And along with that, uh, the, uh, the injustices of relying on uh, transient workers who have little or no uh, workplace security uh, or insurance, uh, but relying on those workers to come in and out of the country to do things like uh, grow pick and harvest food, uh, as is common in Australia. So we need to develop a new paradigm and one that's compatible with living in harmony with what, in what uh, Herman Daly calls a full earth, an earth that no longer can be tolerant uh, of, our, um, of our profligate and wasteful behaviours and unjust behaviours. So final question that could uh, trigger a conversation. Why would those of us who are benefiting from, uh, from, from the lifestyle that the Anthropocene allows us with fast cars and global travel, um, comfort and convenience, why would we want to embrace a new future, this new future? I think there's some things that we could discuss, maybe this conversation we could pursue into the future, because we, could, we can start in a process of reimagining re our sense of what makes life worthwhile. And I suggest to you that just being an economic agent, closing the profit loop for some corporation is not what makes you fully human and not what makes for a life well lived. We could start to see ways that perhaps we could celebrate slower, less flexible, less material varied systems that tend to be more local, precisely because they allow us to be more uh, creative, uh, enhance our self-agency, uh, produce greater producer-to-consumer solidarity, and actually give us the freedom and time that we need uh, to, to conduct a rich uh, human life. Uh, world activities that, act, that uh, are conducted at a scale and pace that allows us to use our evolved capacity as humans to satisfy our needs and desire by use of our, our, our human capacity for reason and agency. And to satisfy those desires without doing a profligate amount of harm to landscapes and people uh, elsewhere. Uh, uh, and I would suggest to you that most of us, most of the time, would, not, would like to think we weren't causing undue harm to other people and landscapes um, just in the pursuit of what Dr. Chapman was calling uh, everyday uh, uh, normality. Okay, I'm running out of time, uh, so I won't go through this uh, slide. It's from uh, uh, readings from Week and Withicombe and Redmond, uh, but uh, challenging the skill sets that we need, the, ap the uh, aptitudes that we need to develop as future change agents to teach our students to be future change agents, these functionalists 
uh, complexes of knowledge, skills, and attitudes that enable the successful task performing and problem solving to tackle wicked problems. And I finish on Ellen Swallow Richards, who uh, was mentioned by Dr. Chapman, and her vision for human ecology, which has obviously changed across time, but still has some core components of what I think we are still pursuing a hundred and plus years later. And that's the central reason I think human ecology is the right tool for the job. It's the study of the surroundings of human beings in the effects they produce on their lives. And I still agree with Ellen to say that it's the worthiest of all the applied sciences because it teaches the principles on which to found a healthy and happy life. So Salamat Po, thank you. Any questions? We I believe we're now going to go into a conversation question space and I look forward to any uh, responses you might have. Thank you so much, Dr. Rob. I think again, there's so many ideas in our head right now and we're very excited to ask the question. The excitement just built up and we are deeply honored to be joined by you, Dr. Rob. You're home again. <laughs> As some faculty said, you're back home in the Philippines, albeit uh, virtually, right? Thank you. So can we give Dr. Rob a clap emoji? Right, a clap emoji for Dr. Rob. Yeah, okay. So we're seeing clap emojis. Just a little bit of numbers, right? So we're around... Um, 266 here now on Zoom and more than around more than 50 on Facebook. And of course, many are still watching this recorded um, webinar, right? Especially some of our students who are not here. But all in all, we're around 300 right now who are watching live. I'll now give this, the Zoom stage to our lead organizer, the one who helped in putting so much effort to make this check conversation happen. Let us have a heart emoji for Assistant Vice Chancellor, Dr. Jenny Amparo. She will facilitate the open forum. Dr. Jenny, take it away. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Ron. Actually, Prof. Ron, Prof. Mafe, uh, Mom, Emmy, Prof. Emmy and uh, Prof. Anna, uh, and together, of course, with Dean Ricky and Melvin, have really worked together for this conference. And uh, I feel at home because uh, my advisor is here, Dr. Rob, <laughs> and of course, Dr. Sherry Ann. All right. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, actually, the chat box is full of questions uh, uh, that I should read. No? But anyway, um, thank you very much. Um, Regard, uh, it's time for us to do this reflect, reflexive reimagination. Re and thank you very much, Doc Rob and uh, Doctor Sherry Ann, for sharing, for your sharings. No, um, we were revitalized. We were re-inspired about our discipline as well. So uh, with that, I think Doctor Rob also needs to introduce the the animal in the last slide. <laughs> so just yeah. <laughs> Who's that, Dr. Rob? One of the en endemic, yeah, <laughs> creatures from that, Australia. <laughs> that was a that was a mountain pygmy possum, uh, and um, I, I put that image in. I didn't have time to touch on it really, but I don't know if you've watched the movie uh, Don't Look Up. But throughout Don't Look Up, there's a, a series of inserted little uh, um, Montes. So, uh, images of animals, of people, babies, just landscapes. And they never explain why those are in there. But as you walk through the movie, they're saying, these are all the things we're going to lose if we don't do something about justice and sustainability. So, you know, it's not all about us humans. It's about the things we love and value around. And, yeah, cute animals like pygmy possums. They don't have to earn a quid to deserve to be there. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Dr. Rob. Yeah. So miss seeing those uh, creatures. So anyway, all right. So we'll start with questions addressed to both speakers. So um, there's a question here from, um, oops, this is not addressed to, wait. Okay. So for both speakers, um, two general questions. So uh, Prof. Carla, would you like me to read this? Or we miss you a lot. So would you like to read your question, Mom Carla? <laughs> Or I think Bam Carla is in a class. Go ahead, Dr. All right. 
Okay, thank you, Prof. Carla. All right, the question is, human ecology has been said to be multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary, or transdisciplinary. Where do you think is the direction that the field should take in the future to respond to these wicked problems that Dr. Rob and Dr. Sherry has mentioned? So uh, anyone could start. Um, Dr. Sherry Ann, would you like to start, please? Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Jenny. I uh, I noticed actually I was reading the presentation by by Carla Prof Carla uh, regarding a trajectory of was it um, disciplinary multidisciplinary interdisciplinary transdisciplinary it caught my attention and it's interesting I don't know that in the Department of Human Ecology at the U of A we have not been using transdisciplinary very much recently um, I think what comes to mind, especially when I'm introducing human ecology in our 100 level course, when people are just beginning to learn about the field of study. I turn to Dr. McGregor's article where she describes a concern about more a tension between generalism and specialization. So this is a, a roundabout way of maybe of responding to the question. Dr. McGregor uh, has argued that we need to maintain a sense of a uh, general human ecology identity, even as we are also increasing our depth of understanding with specialized areas or specialized sciences. And so if transdisciplinary is another way of talking about how we can be both generalists and specialists, then I, I would say, yeah, that's I'm putting my hand up. Let's go with transdisciplinary because if it has that potential, I think it's important for both and type of identity as human ecologists that we we have our generalist understanding and our specialist understanding because we need them all. Yeah. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much, Dr. Sherry Ann, for recognizing you know, that we both need it's not an you know an or type, but an N as well. So thank you very much. Dr. Rob, would you like to answer, please? Thank you. Yes, I think um, I think the we use the word discipline. I think one reason that you might want to avoid it or not not emphasise it is is it does suggest that the answers to the problem sit within academia, uh, and of course they don't. They sit. Uh, we can contribute. We can help, uh, but we need to reach out to those other knowledge bases, those other lived experiences, uh, and of course those aren't disciplinary at all. Uh, and I think uh, I think the other thing we need to recognise is the world itself is not divided into disciplines, right? Human minds impose disciplines on it because that finds it a useful way to drill for oil or a useful way to make an aeroplane fly or whatever. And that's all perfectly, perfectly uh, valid. But we do need to acknowledge that there is no lines on the map, that the lines on the earth that are actually divided into, into disciplines. So that would be my point. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Chapman, you're referring to Sue McGregor? Yeah, so Sue McGregor, I'll put a link uh, because she's written a very interesting article in the race ish, recent issue of, of Human Ecology Review. So I'll just put that a, as a link because Human Ecology Review uh, is a free open access resource and her paper was very interesting. Thank you, Dr. Rob, and thank you for that sharing as well uh, for that article of Dr. McGregor. All right, another question is, how do we enhance the appreciation of human ecology amidst the trends in many countries or in human ecology faculties in many universities are, are being reorganized and some of the programs have, uh, human ecology programs have been lost. So I think uh, that was shared also by uh, Dr. Sherry Ann and in ANU, for example, uh, we have the human ecology program, but that there's no really department of human ecology or a college of human ecology. So how do we address that? Thank you. Um, yeah, Dr. Sherry Ann. Thank you. Um, yes. Oh dear. <laughs> in Canada, this has been quite a, a significant part of our story too. At the University of Manitoba, there used to be a faculty of human ecology also, and it was disbanded a few years ago. And so if you were to try to find the human ecologists at that university in Canada, you would have to look for their specializations. And they are there, but they're buried within other units. We at the U of A have been going through a reorganization with this additional level of colleges being added 
to our structure. And when that process began about two years ago, um, much of the university was concerned about what would happen and lots of units were concerned. And, and that certainly was something that was a concern for the Department of Human Ecology. What we are trying to do is to associate ourselves with the Council for Sustainability at the U of A and also look to create a center of social innovation. And this is a very young, early idea that our chair, Dr. Rhonda Breitkreitz is leading. And so I think that we're attempting to make the link also to the sustainability, uh, the sustainable development goals to place ourselves into the conversation globally about how can we create, co-create change together, all the while keeping our name, our identity, human ecology in the mix. So I don't have one answer. Um, it is a concern that we share and we are intent on re retaining our name and identity because we also feel like we're really well placed to be joining this collective effort. Thank you. Over to you, Dr. Naimal. I think um, the reality is that human ecology and transdisciplinary approaches to teaching, learning and research in general just never do sit comfortably within the ultimately sort of monastic structures of uh, academia. Um, and the more that uh, academia becomes um, managerialized and sort of essentially bottom line profit cost dip driven, uh, the further it wanders away from being able to understand that you need to be able to think across boundaries and cross disciplinary silos. Uh, I think it's tragic, but it's also inevitable. And I think it's been going on since time immemorial, and yet human ecology seems to somehow uh, survive and flourish and find different places to practice. And I think that will keep going on. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Dr. Rob. And I think uh, the the role also of the Society of Human Ecology to really strengthen the, the interconnection between different human ecologists in different countries, uh, re regardless of there's a college of human ecology in that university, but there are a lot of human ecologists in different uh, universities globally as well. So thank you very much for that. The work that you're doing in the University of the Philippines is, is an important component of that. And then reaching out to other places where maybe human ecology is not so strong or doesn't go by that name, so Vietnam, Myanmar, or whatever. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. So we had initial talks actually with our Southeast Asian counterparts as well. So those are the things that we are working on together with ANU and hopefully with the University of Alberta as well. So thank you very much. Okay, so uh, another question for uh, both Dr. Sh uh, Sherry Ann and Dr. Daibel is let me double check. All right, okay. Uh, there are a lot of growth points of human ecology, which I think uh, Dr. Rob and Dr. Sherian has mentioned in their talks uh, uh, from sociology to human economics. Um, and human ecology has been defined differently in different universities and countries. What then is the common thread across the human ecology tradition? I think this is more of a clarification regarding the presentations. Thank you. Dr. Sherian. Thank you for the this question too. And I'm curious, I'll offer a thought and then I'm really curious to hear other thoughts, including Dr. Diebold's too. Um, as I said in, in my reflections, we have brought it down to this short statement of enhancing everyday life. And in the Department of Human Ecology at the U of A, we have our focus on near environments. And so as colleagues, we have very diverse areas of interest that can be brought back to the idea of enhancing everyday life. And we also refer to exploring everyday life. So uh, referring to that, a reference to science too. So that's what we say our mission is. Dr. Daibel, what, do you, what mission um, or purpose statement, is there something that connects all of you and your unit? Yeah, probably not. In, uh... Uh, I mean, we've got one. I, I can't remember. <laughs> can't remember what it is off the top of my head. Uh, but it's certainly some. It's certainly a, a recognition that um, uh, we can't be looking at uh, questions of what it is to live well, um, and that's embedded in your uh, uh, your sort of notion of 
or enhancement or whatever you, the actual term you used, uh, you know, we can't be looking at that without looking to some, in some way between the biophysical material uh, and the socio-cultural. Um, and across my broader school, um, some areas focus much more on things like biodiversity conservation and don't have a lot of sort of social policy planning, community engagement in them. And then others are purely on, much more strongly on the International Fora for Climate Change, Forum for Climate Change and Pacific Island involvement and you know, less on biophysical. But none of them would be exclusively. And we like to think of human ecology as the thing that sits in the middle and does that, that linking, that putting together. Thank you, Dr. Rob, Dr. Sherian. Um, and then this is the last question for, um, for a general question, which is uh, there's a lot of disciplines or um, fields which uh, uh, covers uh, the, the different human ecological uh, issues. Uh, what's the strongest, uh, this is from, I think this is from Anna, what is the strongest value proposition of human ecology to complement these other fields or at least uh, be relevant in terms of addressing wicked problems? So what, what could we bring into the table in terms of, uh, you know, what value could we bring in, especially if we, we're working with an integrative team, uh, working on wicked problems, for example. Okay. Dr. Rob? Uh, I would, uh, to the extent I get the question, uh, uh, disciplinary science is fundamentally reductive and it, it has to be to do what it does. But the nature of the problems and the nature of policymaking in general, it's just any kind of collective agreed behavior in general is fundamentally synthetic. Uh, it requires the putting together of pieces. Uh, and so um, uh, those disciplinary areas have very important contributions to make. They can't actually make them unless, unless they are put into a, a broader context in which the information they generate can actually do what those scientists want it to do, which is to create mm -hmm. change in the world and not only change, but change for the better. Yeah. So... That's something that's those synthesis. Thank you. Dr. Sherry? I had to think a moment, but I think that when I think about the curriculum of courses that we have in our undergraduate degree, uh, a particular value piece that comes to mind is a distinction we make between encouraging students to understand that human ecologists try to work with this power with approach as opposed to power over. And it sounds like a binary. And when we introduce it, we're, we are setting up that comparison, power over, power with, we, we're striving towards power with. An additional layer, I think that we're also working, we certainly do also use the term change agent. And I've become familiar with change making also, and that draws on uh, Chaudhry, uh, Shaquille Chaudhry in terms of a deep diversity framework. And we're thinking in terms of equity, diversity, inclusivity, indigenous initiatives. And so I agree with Dr. Dybul in terms of a collaborative, as I understood it, a collaborative coming together, leaning in, even when we might be um, worried or scared, but we need to lean in because that's how we're going to do it together. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, could I call on Christian Rosales from Anthropologist from UPLB to, would you like to share the, your question, please? Christian, are you still there or should I read it? Okay. So uh, Christian uh, is asking Dr. Chapman, uh, thank you for that insightful talk, especially in the highlight of Indigenous people's plight in Canada. As someone working with and among Indigenous peoples in the Philippines, I also observe similar problems. Those problems arise. Um, just a moment. Okay. Uh, all right. Those problems arise from issues concerning land tenure when the state and allied organization bring in and impose over their own ideas. Uh, of development. So in Canada, how are these issues handled by the Canadian government? 
and how could um, human ecology help in terms of addressing these issues in terms of uh, working with uh, indigenous people? Thank you. Thank you for that question. Hmm. <laughs> in terms of what I'm understanding is the first part of the question in terms of government, I, there are probably many layers and, and much history attached to that part of the question. In, uh, in the land that, that is also known by some indigenous peoples as Turtle Island, and in the part that is now known as Canada, uh, there are there's both treated land and unceded land. So different types of agreements that have existed or, or not over time. And I suppose that points to um, a larger scale of, of um, awareness that is not part of my own work. And I tend to think more in terms of the, the intimate scale of individuals and families and more local communities. And so I'll speak to that part of the question more. One thing I'm learning from our own students as they graduate and they move into profession and, and further study too, and who are, who self-identify as indigenous, I, I continue to learn from them. And so one graduate comes to mind, Sandra Gosling, who, has helped me to keep track of not assuming and presenting um, the need for change in terms of deficit, in terms of indigenous communities um, only having issues or problems, but also to see and, and help others to understand that indigenous cultures um, have strengths and so much that they can give and can be leading. So, I think it's from where I sit and the nature of the work I do, I'm striving to help people to understand and to, um, to challenge stereotypical thinking and that that then can help how they go on in their practice, whether it's in policy making or in practice uh, in, with people or additional research. So a bit of a winding response. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sherry Ann. Uh, we understand because uh, especially working with communities, not only with indigenous people, there's a lot of context that we need to put into or to consider as well. So I, I think uh, the openness uh, of uh, human ecology and openness to collaboration uh, is one of our assets as well. So uh, this question is addressed to Dr. Uh, Daibel. Uh, what major role would, woman, uh, would human ecologists play in this fast advancing digital and artificial intelligence world? So I guess because uh, of the fourth industrial revolution and there's a talk about fifth industrial revolution, which I think the Philippines haven't rich yet, but anyway, so Dr. Rob, um, this uh, last question for you. Yeah. Uh, the, I would, um, I'm, looking at, I'm looking at my bookshelf up here is what I was doing. I, I would uh, stay towards, uh, um, I the gentleman's name, Dan. Um, uh, he's just written a book uh, on exactly this thing. So uh, I can't see it. All right. The answer is, I mean, I think uh, uh, the information sphere, the, uh, the capacity for uh, this book, Social Ecology in the Digital, Digital Age, right, by Daniel Stokeholz has probably got a better take on the answer than I could give you. Human ecology, I would say, like any other ecology is about, um, concerns itself at one level about uh, how uh, information uh, helps direct the movement of material and material and energy. That's one take of what ecology actually is. Uh, and what we've done in creating the internet is the largest structure that humankind has ever built uh, is created a, a, a huge new information sphere uh, that uh, allows uh, knowledge and, and not just knowledge, it'll see, um, falsehoods to, to move around the world with obviously lightning uh, speed. Uh, and, uh, you know, if you think back to human history and 
uh, certainly, you know, indigenous peoples, uh, the link between belief uh, and the realities of the ecosystems within that in which they live, being very tightly tied up. If you, if you didn't believe sensible things about the way the ecosystem functioned, you'd probably do yourself a mischief. Now, of course, uh, we can share beliefs all over the world that are what um, uh, Stephen Boyden would call a, a mal maladaptative in, in, in that they lead to behaviours that are distinctly bad for us. But those, those, those belief sets don't die out with the people who host them uh, because they can spread through internet and other, and other uh, medium. So it's an interesting new take on, on what's continuing a, a, a part of human adapt, adaptation and, and indeed evolution, uh, just moving out into, a, into an electronic uh, pathways. But I would, I would definitely um, suggest you read uh, Social Ecology in the Digital Age. There's a review on it in Human Ecology Review for a couple of years back. All right. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you very much. All right. Just similar with any conversations, this could go on forever uh, because we really love to talk to Dr. Sherry Ann and Dr. Rob, but uh, we know we're also conscious of the time. But similar with conversations as well, this is just the start of continuing con uh, conversations with Dr. Rob, who's been with us. Uh, uh, the first time we met Dr. Rob was 2013. So we're still talking to Dr. Rob. So thank you, Dr. Rob and uh, Dr. Sherry Ann. I'll uh, uh, disclose our conversations. If you have additional questions, just email us. Uh, we'll gladly um, also share with you the contact details of our two distinguished speakers. So thank you very much, uh, Prof. Ron, Dr. Thank you. Round very of applause, much. please. Yes, please let's give a heart emoji to Dr. Jen and our two speakers. Yes, thank you very much, Dr. Rob and Dr. Sherry Ann. And I think. Um, we are now moving to the presentation of certificates to our speakers to be given by Dr. Edgar M. Reyes, Jr., the chair of the SERP. Sir Edgar, please, and Prof. Mappe will flash the uh, certificates. Thank you. Hi, again, good morning to everyone. Let me read the citation for the certificate. Certificate of Appreciation is awarded to Dr. Sherry Ann Chapman for serving as a guest speaker in the webinar on CHG Conversations, Unpacking the Value of Human Ecology in an Increasingly Complex and Connected World, organized by the College of Human Ecology, held this 24th of February, 2022. Thank you so very much. I'm deeply honored. Thank you. Dr. Jennifer Marie S. Amparo. Okay, I think my connection is not so good, but the other certificate of appreciation is awarded to Dr. Robert Daibal for serving as a guest speaker in the webinar on CHG Conversations, Unpacking the Value of Human Ecology in an Increasingly Complex and Connected World, organized by the College of Human Ecology, held this 24th of February, 2022 via Zoom. Signed, Dean of the College of Human Ecology, Ricardo M. Sandalo, and the lead organizer for the CHG Conversations 2022, Dr. Jennifer Marie S. Amparo. Round of applause, please, for our two distinguished guest speakers. Thank you, Dr. Ricky. Thank you, Dr. Jenny. Thank you, everyone, for inviting me on this and um, providing the certificate. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sir Edgar. And I think Dr. Edgar, um, really made an effort to, um, to present the certificate. What an effort, right? And what a celebration also of human ecology. And again, like all good things, it has to come to an end. We have 300 live audience who are here. Such a milestone. Usually when we organize um, webinars, we have 100, we have around 150, but right now it's double than that, right? And we also have many students who will be watching on Recording. We are so honored to have Dr. Sherry Ann and Dr. Daibel together um, in the same uh, Zoom link. At this point, may I call? May I invite everyone um, to listen for the closing remarks to another champion of human ecology and who's also very interested in understanding our field, uh, Dr. Maria Teresa Talavera, our associate dean at the college. Dr. Ted, please. 
Hello. Um, good day, everyone. Uh, my internet is a little bit unstable, so I might not be able to open my camera the whole time. So, but first and foremost, and on behalf of the College of Human Ecology and our Dean, uh, Dr. Ricardo Sandalo, let me extend our deepest gratitude to our partners in organizing this webinar. We have the Humane Philippines, and then of course, the Office for Institutional Development in Higher Education, and the College of Human Ecology Alumni Association. And thank you very much as well to all the participants for joining us in this learning activity and to our international speakers, of course. Uh, so thank you very much, Dr. Sherry Ann Chapman and Dr. Uh, Robert Baibol. Uh, indeed, you are a member of our family, of our growing family of human ecologists. So the CHE Conversations is the first seminar this year organized in our college. This webinar is quite important to us internally and at the college as we are composed of individuals with various disciplines and indeed it is human ecology that connects us together as an organization. This webinar is also important to us as we promote human ecology as a discipline and as a profession. I am certain that each one of us have learned from the presentations of our speakers, and I hope it further deepened, rekindled, and stimulated our thinking about human ecology. So before ending my closing remarks, let me say that the webinar has been very effective in meeting its objectives as mentioned by Professor Mendoza uh, earlier. We were able to discuss human ecology, its history, its value, and the future directions. So let's look forward to more check conversations as we future-proof and make CHA resilient. As Dean Sandalo said, let's be more optimistic of our future. We do have a lot to contribute to enhancing the everyday lives of the Filipino people. So finally, my deepest thanks to the organizers led by Prof. Jen uh, Amparo and of course, uh, Sir, Pro, uh, Sir Ron, Professor Dankalan, and the rest of the team. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you, AD Ted. At this point, um, I, may, and I know that we, we wanted to stay, stay here, the Zoom, but I think at this point that, that ends our program. But before we close our Zoom, may I invite everyone to open your camera for the photo documentation. Uh, Prof. Ron and Sir Melvin, please do the honor of taking the screenshots. So while our um, audience, uh, students, colleagues, and um, participants in the Zoom are opening their cameras, I would like to uh, remind everyone that uh, please answer the evaluation sheet. We will be sharing the link and it will automatically generate your certificate of attendance to our event. event. So are you ready with your smiles? for our photo documentation for this first check conversations. Okay, Prof. Mafe, I think um, they're so ready. Sorry, it will be, it will take quite a while because there we are 250 almost here. <laughs> okay, just smile, just smile and I'll, uh, and I'll prompt it. Okay, so the first slide, please smile. Okay, the second slide, one, two, three. But we the have third to smile slide, all throughout, huh? You have to smile all throughout. <laughs> the third slide, the fourth slide, and the fifth slide. Okay, so thank you very much. And according to tradition, please stay. Um, we'll sing the UP Naming Mahal. UP Naming Mahal is the um is the anthem of the University of the Philippines as we end. And for our speakers and organizers, if you can stay just a little bit so that we can <laughs> talk a little bit, okay.
Okay, so thank you very much and we hope to see you in the next Czech Conversations. We put the evaluation link on our chat group. If you cannot access it, we will post it on the College of Human Ecology Facebook page so that you can access it and we will be able to fix the settings. Thank you very much. And for our speakers and organizers, if you can stay just a little bit, maybe two minutes. For the rest, thank you very much and have a good evening if you're in North America. Have a good afternoon if you're in Australia and happy lunch if you're here in the Philippines and Southeast Asia. And of course, we saw some people from the US and, and from the rest. Thank you very much for the successful webinar that we have. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye, bye-bye. And for our organizers to say a little bit. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Oh, there's a lot of thank you messages. I think um, our uh, students and also um, I think there's a lot of... Um, there's a lot of participants from other provinces as well in the Philippines, and they're all very happy. So thank you, thank you. Um, and we are looking forward to the evaluation form. We will share to our speakers as well the qualitative statements, the feedback from our, um, from our speakers. Okay, so for the organizers, and if some faculty would like to remain, please, we can remain a little bit for just a quick um, chat. Okay, so let's just wait for other... Um, Participants to, to go down, but for some faculty, if you want to chat a little bit, very, very quickly, um, let's remain. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Sherry Ann and Dr. Rob, uh, for your time. Um, Dr. Sherry Ann, uh, sorry, I wasn't able to ask. Actually, we're interested with the professional human ecology certificate that Canada is issuing because in the Philippines, um, um, having a certificate is a prime. Is that correct? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So well, we're very interested to explore that. Yeah. I'd be happy to. It, it's actually a provincial uh, government of Alberta legislation. It took us 25 years. So it's a process. Um, okay. And I don't know the whole story, but I'd be happy to share what I do. Yeah. Wow. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Sharon, it's a license, right? It's a so professional it's a license. Yeah. It's a regulated status.